On Monday this week appeared a report in the Australian about a conference that's just been held here and an Oxford Don was there and I think his name was Llewellyn Smith. I think it was Sir John or Sir Richard or something. And he said, and I, I, I'm quoting from the press and he'll forgive me if I'm wrong, if I got it wrong. I'll blame the Australian, but what he said was that Australia should have nuclear reactors. They're safe, uh, Fukushima hasn't killed anyone, and you know we should get with it and get with the strength and get the new technology going. I don't think he quite knows the depth of ambiguous feelings that exist in this country towards nuclear power, but I'll come to that a bit later. Today I want to look firstly at what happened at Fukushima briefly, what the implications have been for the Japanese, particularly those who live in the Tohoku region of northern Honshu, but also the, the nation as a whole. Look at the implications internationally for the events at Fukushima, and finally look at Australia and how if at all this has affected us. Firstly, the accident. You, you all know about this, but let me quickly rehearse that there were six reactors in a line on the Fukushima coast in a disused or formerly used naval air station. And they're very close to the coast. They're very large and very prepossessing. Big square buildings painted blue. And on the 11th of, Oct 11th of March, 2011, last year, a an earthquake, a Daijishin, a very big earthquake, about a force eight or force nine, occurred off the coast of, of uh, Fukushima to the east. It wasn't just one earthquake, it was two. And they created a tsunami. And the tsunami, again, it was two waves. They came towards the coast of Fukushima at about the speed of a jet aircraft uh, coming in cruise mode and they crashed on the shore and they inundated the reactors. What happened, uh, propagandists for the nuclear industry or pro-nukes will say that the earthquake had nothing to do with meltdowns at Fukushima. And George Monbiot, that well-known British polemicist, said that um, this proves that nuclear power is safe because the reactors survived the earthquake and the only thing that destroyed him was the unexpected tsunami that happened afterwards. That's not so. The sequence was the earthquake took place. It rattled the buildings, it shook the whole prefecture, it shook Tokyo and it went on and on. After it occurred there was a power blackout in the region. The grid went out and as scheduled, the, the, the emergency generators at Fukushima cooked, kicked in. So they kept the cold water pumping through the three out of six reactors that were online. One, two, and three. Four, five, and six were offline. And so they kept the temperature down and they kept the thing stable. Then the tsunami came crashing in about 40 minutes after the earthquake inundated the generators behind the um, reactors, which were placed in a very foolish position. They should have been inland and uphill, but there they were just behind the reactors, and put them all out except one. The one couldn't cope, the pumps stopped, the coolant water in the reactors stopped, and the reactors themselves began to heat up, one, two, and three. They got so hot that the water in the reactor vessels boiled off and the reactor elements were exposed to the air. And this, they simply got hotter and they got hotter and hotter and began to melt down. And the zirconium cladding around the enriched uranium-235 and the rods began to melt. And when they, they melted, uh, a chemical reaction occurred in which hydrogen was released and the hydrogen, which is very volatile, began to fill up the spaces inside the containments of the reactors. Workmen and, and technicians ran around in a panic. The, very bravely, they stayed there and they tried to work in the increasing heat and the, the darkness. 
And they tried to uh, find the control to vent the hydrogen gas out of the reactor containment vessels, but they hadn't been taught how to do it because they're offline, so there was not no automatic way of doing it. And they had to find the manuals to do it manually and to open up the, the sluices, you see. And, of course, this didn't work. So within about 12 hours... The inevitable happened and there were explosions, enormous explosions in reactors one, then three, then two. Blew the tops off the buildings. Meanwhile, the reactors were melting down and the core of about 100 tonnes of highly irradiated fuel was, was going through the floor of the containment, the very tough steel containment vessels inside the reactors and pooling on the floor of the, of the, uh, of the uh, concrete pad on which the reactors were based. Very tough, but then concrete itself will melt when you get to about 2,000 degrees centigrade and forms a, a, a slurry called cerium. And when that happens, the molten mass will go through the concrete into the ground underneath and into the groundwater. Emergency Fire uh, brigades came up from Tokyo and tried to work on the reactors and use cooling water. Uh, helicopters came in from the self-defence forces and tried to bomb the reactors from the top, but they kept getting irradiated, the crews, and they had to come back with lead plating welded to the bottom of the, of the helicopters. That didn't work either because there was a strong wind blowing the wind away. Uh, meanwhile, the water that was building up in the reactors from all this cooling, and one, one of the managers poured in salt water because he didn't have any fresh water. He knew that the managers wouldn't want this because the salt water corrodes the reactors and makes them worthless, but he had to do something to try and put out the fire, as it were, but it didn't work. A, a huge amount of radioactive water went out to sea, and most of the air was now becoming contaminated with clouds of radiation. And this included cesium-137 and iodine-131. Iodine is a, is a, a calcium analogue, and it, it, uh, it affects the bones and the teeth. And strontium-90, and iodine also attacks the thyroid gland here. And strontium also is a, is a calcium analogue, and that gets into the bones. You had a lot of other transuranics and, um, and other elements, other radioactive isotopes, including plutonium-239, probably the deadliest of all, an alpha emitter. Fortunately, when this first happened and the, the breaches occurred and after the explosions, the, air, the, the, the wind was blowing out to the northeast of the reactors out to sea, but it quickly veered around and went to the northwest and it blew over all those beautiful mountains in Fukushima and Miyagi and Iwate prefectures and irradiated the, the land around there. The government was in panic. Prime Minister Naoto Khan first obfuscated and wouldn't say what was going on because he didn't know what was going on, but secondly, because he didn't want to panic people. TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, which is the largest electricity generating company with a vertical structure. They just don't generate it, they market it as well and distribute it. TEPCO wasn't saying what was going on, A, because they didn't know, but B, because they, were, they wanted to try and limit the liability of the, the enormous bill that they're going to have for, for this material. Uncharacteristically, Naoto Khan appeared on television and lost his cool and called them a bunch of uh, how do you say fuckwit in Japanese? But that's what he did. And, and uh, very uncharacteristic, because the Japanese are very good at staying cool. But he didn't. And uh, he, he let it all out. He fell on his sword as Prime Minister in, in August of that year because he just simply couldn't stand the opprobrium that he was getting from the people who had to blame someone. And they blamed TEPCO, but they also blamed the Democratic Justice Party of Japan uh, government for not knowing what was going on. Now, Al Khan is now a very strong anti-nuclear advocate in Japan and wants to close the whole industry down. 
His successor, Yoshihiko Noda, the new prime minister, is a lot more wishy-washy and less determined about nuclear power than his predecessor and might like to keep them going. But what is happening is that the people are getting so angry about what's happened that uh, there is a growing, again, unchar uncharacteristically political, fiercely political anti-nuclear feeling developed, developing in Japan. And I'll come to that when I come to the conclusions. The Japanese government formed a 10 mile, a 10 kilometer radius around the reactors exclusion zone. They then increased that to 20. Then they increased it to 30. It, it was because the, in, within that 30, there were villages like Iwate and Namie that were being bombarded by radiation. But the trouble with this, you see, is that radiation doesn't work like that from a reactor accident. It spreads out like the tentacles of an octopus. And this is what happened here, because many of the hills well outside that 30 kilometre uh, diameter range were, were radiated, and places quite close to the reactor were not. The Americans, to add confusion to the situation, the Americans advised all Americans to get out of the area anywhere within 80 kilometres. The Australians sort of didn't know what was going on, but we did have Australians and there's consular responsibilities and they were trying to get our people out as well. So were the Kiwis, so were the Russians. So were all the foreigners, all the Gaijin uh, embassies were trying to get their people out. But as my former colleague Murray McLean, the ambassador in Tokyo at the time said, he found it very hard to get any information from the Japanese government, the Gaimashaw, the foreign ministry, because they weren't telling him what was going on, probably because they didn't know. So he, he didn't quite know what to advise Australians there. In my book, I talk about two young Australian men in the region at the time, Terry Colbert, a, a, a baker from Queensland, and another young chap from, from Melbourne who was there. Uh, and they didn't go, they, they stayed on because they wanted to prove that, you know, we're not just going to cut and run because we're foreigners, we're going to stay with the locals. And they actually had uh, connections. Uh, Terry actually was married to a Japanese and he had four young children at the time. He eventually went because the information he was getting about radiation that you could not see or feel or smell or touch was pretty insidious and, he, and, and it was much more effectively destructive of young children than it was of adults. So he took his kids and they, they left and they went home to Queensland, leaving behind his parents-in-law, a poor rice farmer, who tr was still trying to make ends meet a year and a half after the accident. He, he, had, to actually, uh, he had to actually take his crop out and mill it and harvest his crop to prove to Tepco that he was uh, he was trying his hardest to, to uh, sell his crop because they wouldn't compensate him otherwise. It was found to be impregnated with cesium-137 and like many farmers in the region, he had to fill out a 60-page questionnaire from TEPCO to prove that he had actual damages. Of course, they were doing this as a, as a barrier to try and stop people making claims because they were going to go broke and have gone broke. My wife Alison and I went there and we went to some of the villages, um, Soma and Minami Soma on the coast and saw these patient lines of Japanese workers and farmers, agricultural workers, queuing up at the local offices to try to fill in the forms and wrestle with the bureaucracy that they were facing to get compensation. Didn't make TEPCO very popular at all. This chap, this British Don who spoke and claimed that uh, Fukushima hadn't caused any deaths yet, here in Melbourne last Monday that I referred to earlier, is missing the point. And quite frankly, it's a very disingenuous claim to make. The fact is that radiation, ionising radiation, doesn't kill you immediately unless you get massive doses like the victims at Hiroshima and Nagasaki got. It kills slowly, if at all. Sometimes some people survive. They don't. They might get a dose of cesium or iodine or strontium and not get thyroid cancer and not get cancer of the lungs from plutonium, but some will. And the trouble is, you see, ladies and gentlemen, we don't yet know, the science does yet not yet know, the full extent 
of the mor morbidity and the mortality from radiation. And that's where you have, that's where you have the debate, the public debate. And I have to say that the pro-nuclear industry, because it is an industry and it's a very powerful one and very wealthy, is playing on the politics of doubt, just as the tobacco industry did before it. Oh, the tobacco industry said, this is nonsense, you're not going to get lung cancer, tobacco actually helps you. And then later on they calmed that down a bit and made it less, uh, less uh, so confrontational. But the nuclear industry is doing, it's a bit like the same with global warming denialists who say we're not going to have global warming, it's not happening. And disgracefully, I think you see in the Murdoch press a preponderance of articles by the heterodox uh, scientists who say that global warming is not occurring because somehow Rupert Murdoch, for his own agenda, his own reasons, doesn't want it to be happening. So I'd suggest to you that tobacco, global warming, and now nuclear radiation all are actually in the same category. They're all happening and they're all dangerous. The psychological damage in Japan has been tremendous. We talked to many people, uh, officials, local government people, farmers, um, individuals, about what was going on. And one young chap, a Canadian, America, a Canadian Japanese who spoke fluent Japanese, took us on our trip around the south of the coast to see all the damage done by the tsunami. And he's aggressively saying, look, it's all right. It's, I'm, I'm convinced I've done all the reading and I don't think radiation is going to kill me or my family. He had young kids. The doctor in the radiological um, clinic at the Fukushima Medical Center said the same thing quite aggressively. He said, I'm here to show that radiation does not kill you and I'm fighting a propaganda war to say that it doesn't. You'd think that someone with his qualifications would have had a different view. He had young children too. Meanwhile, 160,000 people didn't feel that way and evacuated. Some of them are coming back to some of the areas in northern Honshu, but not many, especially people with young children. And no, I have to say, and I say in my book, Fallout from Fukushima, that apart from six immediate deaths from the so-called uh, nuclear samurai, the brave men who went back into the reactors to try and control things, uh, uh, th um, th the, these, these people are going to die but haven't yet. There have been six deaths, but they, TEPCO says they're all due to other things, uh, heat exhaustion or, or heart attacks or whatever. The fact is there will be a spike in my view and in the view of many people who know the literature and who, who have studied it, there will be a spike in deaths from cancers developed from radiation from Fukushima, but not yet. They'll begin to appear soon, and they'll begin to appear first in young children because they're the most vulnerable. Meanwhile, there have been some radiological surveys done of the Tohoku region, and one thing, some dis disturbing things are coming out. One is that there's a butterfly called the pale green grass butterfly. And they've been looking at drops of this butterfly, which is a native, a local in the region, and finding that the first generation after Fukushima, about 18% of the drop had damaged abdomens and eyes and carapaces and wings, deformed wings and legs. That increased to 28% in the second drop and to 36% in the third drop. And of course, butterflies don't live more than a few days. So this is a kind of a speeded up process to say that radiation is in, ineluctably beginning to affect the, uh, the, the, the wildlife and the insects in the region. They're also doing a study on primates, local monkeys in the region, and finding similar problems with them, abnormalities. Tokyo people have been very concerned about the situation too because large over, overdoses or rather large quantities, large qualities, large deposits of radiation have been fa found under football stadiums in, in unlikely places. Uh, the mothers, particularly mothers of young children in Tokyo have been militant and up in arms and going to the diet and protesting and saying we want we want compensation. We want proof that this is not going to affect our children and turn them either into vegetables or people who can't have children. 
a, a spokesman from the Ministry of the Environment said, oh, look, the kids won't get it. Kids don't, don't stand in one place and they don't eat the dirt and they'll be all right. And one of the mothers said, mine do, and this shouldn't happen, you know. So that, that's another factor that's, that's going on. It's, it's constant. And this indignation is spreading around Japan and people are realising that they've been conned by the 10 nuclear power monopolies that control and own the nuclear facilities, the electricity monopolies, into believing that it's safe at any cost. It's safe. And these have been very clever, these industries, because what they've done is provide money for local infrastructure around the reactors where they built them, provided money for jobs and for roads and for schools and various things. And you find in many of the reactor complexes in Japan, big signs saying radiation is safe, or, or these reactors are safe, they're so safe we don't have to worry about anything. That's all been blown out of the water. There's anger, there's scepticism. And my, 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 my prediction is that nuclear power probably has about 10 to 20 years to run in Japan. Two summers now, they've worked without nuclear power almost totally. The first summer, summer of 2011, they closed all but a, a handful of reactors. And the second summer, the one we've just, they've just passed through, coming into autumn now, all reactors were closed down in Japan, all 54 reactors. And yet the, the Japanese were still able to watch their baseball uh, from their air-conditioned houses, which is a, a speak... A, 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 a um, spike period in the consumption of el electricity in, in Tokyo. And the reason for that, despite the fact that 54 reactors in Japan was providing nearly 30% of electricity in the country, Japan has an astonishing variety of different forms of electricity generation from hydro, geothermal, yes, coal, yes, oil, and yes, natural gas, and they've had to go back to those, and therefore their, their carbon emissions have come up again, but they will go down. But what Japan has not had is any serious attempt to develop renewables like solar and wind and geothermal, proper geothermal from under the ground, and tidal, because the nuclear village has discouraged that. They've said, you can't do it. We don't want this to happen. They haven't said that, but that's, that's been their strategy because we want people to pay money for power from nuclear reactors. That is all changing. And you have uh, an efflorescence in Japan of, of, of indus industrial interest in what Japan has so far lagged behind many other Western countries, developed countries in developing, wind power and solar and geothermal. You know, in those, those, those provinces in northeastern Honshu, they're wonderful hot spring resorts. People go there for the skiing and for the hot springs. There's a, a wonderful uh, resource of power under the ground. It's simply a matter of the local governments and the central governments having the guts to take on the owners of all the hot spring thermal baths and saying, you're going to have to sell to us because we need that underground uh, capacity to create electricity. Let's leave Japan for a moment and turn to the rest of the world. How has it reacted to Fukushima? Taking the, the immediate neighbourhood, the Koreans were delighted because in South Korea, where they have 21 nuclear power reactors and they're building another 10, they're probably the most aggressively pro-nuclear country in the world right now, and they're delighted when they can steal a march over their Japanese. In many ways, they're, they're, they're hated Japanese rivals. And they've just won a huge contract to sell reactors to the United Arab Emirates in the Middle East. So the Koreans, who shed crocodile tears and provided assistance to the Japanese for their disasters, are really secretly quite pleased about what's happening because it means that they might be able to overtake the Japanese in nuclear technology. The Chinese, the Chinese are often put up by pro-nukes as a country that's going ahead with nuclear. They've got about 11 reactors at present online and they have plans to build another 20. But many of those plans have been on the, on the planning board for the last 10, 15 years. And the Chinese are beginning to be skeptical about nuclear power. Uh, you remember about four to six years ago, there was a, a major earthquake in central China that killed many people and, and buildings collapsed and schools fell on the kids. 
because of the what they call the tofu engineering, that is too much sand, too little cement by corrupt construction engineers and builders. People are beginning to wonder whether the reactors in, in China are not subject to the same problems. And did we build those reactors too far up the Yangtze River? What if there's a, a drought? What will happen? Where, where does the cooling water come from? What about the ones on the coast? How solid are they? So there's a feeling of concern radiating around, around China. Taiwan is going ahead and building more reactors, although they've paused as well. In Southeast Asia, um, Gen uh, President uh, Yudi Ono was in Tokyo recently and said, look, we were going to build reactors here, but after Fukushima we're not because we have the same uh, fault lines that you do and we don't want to put reactors in this country. Thailand, there's a standing joke about the Thais that when there's a civilian government, they don't have nuclear reactors, but when the military have a coup, they suddenly do. And that's kind of uh, a bit iffy at present. The only country, though, that I can definitely say is going to go nuclear in Southeast Asia is Vietnam. And the Vietnamese have a, a, a non-democratic government, and they will do what they want, despite what might be growing as an uneasy feeling among the people about whether Vietnam is a suitable country given its susceptibility to typhoons to have nuclear power. The Philippines, where I was posted at one stage and used to travel with the, the uh, engineer who was the construction manager of the big Westinghouse reactor on the Bataan Peninsula, I'd go across with him, Wally Wilgus, and his, his chopper to look at the, 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 the progress of construction there in the mid-70s. That reactor never got off the ground, but there has been talk before Fukushima of starting it up again. I doubt that that will happen. Moving further west, we've got the subcontinent where India and Pakistan, particularly India, is still very gung-ho, and that's an appropriate word to use in India, with nuclear power and want to have more. And here we have a government, the Gillard government, who's prepared to sell uranium to a country that is not a member of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And I'll tell you what, I feel pretty concerned about that because it's showing more and more expediency and rational uh, commercial uh, considerations to what should be a highly protected export industry of uranium. But in, even in India, they're not just even, but in India, there is a wide and growing unruly uh, indignation by many people in many villages against nuclear power. I don't say this with any satisfaction. I don't say this with any sense that they're, so there they'll win the day because they probably won't because the nuclear industry in India as elsewhere is very powerful. In Europe, Germany, the largest economic powerhouse in Europe, as you know, has decided, Angela Merkel made this decision after she'd been very pro-nuclear, that they will close down all their power plants. They've got about 22, and they're going to close sequentially. And if any country can prove that we are a sophisticated industrial powerhouse and we can survive without nuclear, it's Germany. And they were followed by Italy. Silly old Berlusconi had a, a referendum on whether to have nuclear power, and, he, and he, he said we should, but the people said, no, you've had too many, um, too many sex parties. We don't trust you anymore. Spain, Austria, Switzerland, the, the, the Netherlands are all working away, pulling away from nuclear power. Still, we have in Europe the Russians. Russia is very pro-nuclear. Um, uh, the Ukraine, surprisingly enough, even though that's where Chernobyl happened, uh, they, they want to go nuclear, and Poland does too. And so do quite Czechoslovakia, I think, is still very prone to have nuclear power. So it's a kind of a mixed picture in Europe about what's going to happen. In Asia, there seems to be a pull away from it. In Southeast Asia, I don't think they're going to go there except for Vietnam. In Africa, forget it, except for South Africa, where they're... They're experimenting with thorium reactors and with uh, pebble bed reactors. And if you, any of you are interested, I could talk about that, but it's a bit complex and not a proven technology. You see, always the pro-nukes say, hey, but these are old reactors at Fukushima and generation three and four and five are going to be much safer. Why? Oh, well, they've got pumps that work without electricity by gravity and they've got this and they've got that. But it's still the same technology 
You're still using fissile material, uranium-235, or you could use thorium-233, enriched in a reactor to boil water. And that produces as byproducts these actinides and transuranic elements that are highly radioactive and poisonous. And there's no way that we yet know of to, to, to isolate these from the biosphere for the necessary length of their lives. The Yanks have tried it. The Swedes have got fairly close, but they haven't succeeded yet. The French have tried it near Fessenheim, a reactor up on the border of Germany. They haven't done it yet. And I don't think they will, because even if you could bury this stuff, and plutonium has a half-life of 24,400 years, even if you could do that, what, how long do you have to wait before another generation says, oh, we need, that, we need that material to build nuclear weapons? I mean, how far ahead can we look, ladies and gentlemen? I can't even look to the end of the Gillard government. Can we look 10 or 20 or 50 years ahead? Can we look a 1,000 years ahead? Forget it. So that is a problem with nuclear power. Let me come to Australia, and I'll... I'll, I'll come to questions um, straight after that. Australia has always had, in my view, a very schizophrenic view about nuclear matters. We invited the British to come in and explode their atom bombs at Maralinga and Emu Field and out in the Christmas archipelago because we wanted nuclear weapons at that stage, although Bob Menzies, to his credit, didn't. He wanted the, the weapons to stay with Russia and France and Britain and the United States. Let's have no proliferation, but many of his ministers did. John Gordon was building a reactor at Jarvis Bay, not to provide electricity, as he ostensibly said, for the New South Wales grid, but to provide plutonium-239 for Australian nuclear weapons. Gough Whitlam knocked that on the head, fellow comrades, and that was a good thing that he did. But, and we, 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 won't, we won't go there, there's no doubt about that. But we're still prepared to export uranium to almost anyone who wants it. We have safeguards, bilateral safeguard requirements that were handed down by Malcolm Fraser in federal parliament in 1977, which have been eroded and attenuated over the years by commercial considerations and now don't mean a tinker's dam, in my view. And I get very upset with with the, 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 the nabobs in Canberra, especially in DFAT, who say that our safeguards are the best in the world, they're not. And even if we sell uranium to countries that aren't going to use our atoms in nuclear weapons, they're going to, be, they're going to allow their own atoms to be used in, in, in bombs. They, don't make them with, uh, they won't use them for electricity, they'll use ours. There, was, there were two seminars after Fukushima last year held by the Lowy Institute in Sydney. Um, the Lowy Institute is very good in many respects and very objective, but on these two occasions it was very pro-nuclear, invited Australian mining companies to come along and give their view about the so-called objective nature of nuclear power. And these guys were very angry. They were angry at the frustration they feel by Australian regulations that stop selling to whoever they can. They're angry about Fukushima having blown up and therefore putting a spike in their plans to open up new mines. Look what BHP Billiton have done to Olympic Dam in South Australia. They've stopped new developments and they're not opening another mine, Yaliri, in Western Australia. That's happening right across the board. And meanwhile, there's a new phenomenon happening in Australia as reflective of a new tendency in the world as any other country, and that is the growth of solar panels on rooftops and windmills. Do you know that the Institute of Public Affairs in Sydney, which is a very right-wing organisation, runs a, a campaign to try and tell people that windmills are not safe for your health? And there's a little town northwest of Ballarat where they've established a foundation and th these, these people want a, a, a nuclear, they want a, a wind farm, a turbine uh, system put in there. But this mob have gone in to say it's not safe and they truck in people to have protests. They're not going to succeed because people are realising that costs of power are so much cheaper when they develop their own. And there are a couple of reactor, a couple of, uh, uh, of, of large 
coal-fired power plants in, in South Australia, including the Playford plant in Port Adelaide, that have closed because the, the, the demand has been falling off their, for their product. You know, the French used to manufacture reasons for people to consume electricity so that they could justify their 58 nuclear reactors in France, but that's all finished, and I think you're going to find that this just simply grows ineluctably as solar power and wind power and other forms of, of, of renewables becomes cheaper. And that will, that will be the future. And if Germany can do it, and let me finish by saying I think Japan will do the same, they're going to lead the world in, in this new technology. Japan is still the third largest and most powerful economy in the world. And it's not going to go away. We just had the, the latest uh, Japan-Australia ministerial meeting at which Julia Gillard spoke in Sydney uh, at the beginning of this week. And the Japanese said, look, you've got to join us. Kirin Beer was there, which is a major uh, food producer. They own lion breweries and all sorts of things. And they said, we are the future still in Southeast Asia. Join us in our joint ventures in the region because we're not going anywhere. We're not going away. And I firmly believe that. They've taken a blow. There's, there's enormous uncertainty and fear and depression, especially the people who lost their, their friends and families from the tsunami, and that's like a desolate landscape. But they will come back, and it'll be very interesting to see what happens.